want to thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, a little background. In my youth, I was a cardiologist and I had the honor of working with Jerry Slate for many years. Uh, in my dotage, I've been dabbling in photography and uh, including what I call aerial photography, which is basically taking still images from the window seat of commercial airliners. My grandson was aware of this and last September, he approached me and said, how would you like to learn to fly my drone? I jumped at the opportunity and before long I was hooked. So I'm gonna be sharing this new passion with you this morning. I'd like to ask how many of you own drones and have done drone photography. Could you raise your hands? Wow, one, two, three. Wow, okay. So I've gotta be careful what I say. I've got experts. Okay, I'm going to now open my PowerPoint um, talk here. Do, 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 do. Okay, let's go to share screen and I'm going to get this up to. Okay, do you have full screen? Full screen slides, great, okay. Well, what is a drone? The conventional definition says that a drone is an unmanned aerial vehicle. Those of us whose major interest is in photography, a drone is basically a flying computer that happens to have a camera attached to it. The origin of drones have been primarily military, but over the years, the applications have evolved widely. And this is just a incomplete list of the current applications of drones. This morning, I'm gonna limit my remarks, of course, to recreational photography. Not only re recreational photography, but actually still photography. I don't do video. If your drone weighs more than 250 grams, you need to register it with the FAA. FAA controls our skies appropriately. And they impose certain regulations. You need to maintain an altitude under 400 feet. So you don't hit helicopters and airplanes. And you're not supposed to fly within five miles of an airport, but it's actually more complicated than that. There are varying zones of precautions around airports, depending on how close you are to the airport and the major flight paths. And this is a practical issue for, for me. I live in Lexington and I'm reasonably close to Hanscom Field. And if I take my drone out near, say, the old North Bridge in Concord, and I set it up there and try to take off, my drone software will not allow me to take off, which is good. It's a safety issue. The FAA tells us that we need to keep our drones within line of sight. More easily said than done, I'm afraid. The, my drone has a range of five miles. Well, I don't go more than a half mile or a mile at the most, but even at a half mile, I can't always keep my drone in line of sight. And then there are some obvious safety issues. You want to avoid large crowds or highways that are heavily trafficked. How do drones work? I want to apologize for the chutzpah it takes to talk to you guys and gals about how drones work. Most of you have devoted your lives 
to understanding how stuff works. So please be tolerant. There are basically three components. The drone itself, a device that controls the, zone, the drone, and a smartphone app. The drone has to have a source of power, lithium batteries. It has brushless motors that rotate the propellers. And these motors can be controlled, the speed can be controlled. And this is critical as you'll see in a moment. The drone has all kinds of sensors. It has a radio transmitter and a radio receiver built in, and it comes with a, a camera with a gimbal. What's a gimbal? Well, a gimbal is a mount that holds the camera in place and rotates it through three axes. It rotates this way, this way, uh, and this way. So it controls the direction in which the camera is pointing and it provides stabilization. Smartphone app is not essential, but is pretty important because it gives you a real time view of what the camera sees. And when you click the shutter, you record what the camera is seeing. It also gives you a supplementary way of controlling the camera functions, its motion. These drones are not only cute, but they're extraordinarily smart. And the return to home function is a great example. The, the drone can perform autonomously. It can come home automatically if the battery level gets to a certain level. It can come home automatically if it loses contact with the remote controller. <coughs> You've got an investment in these drones, a financial investment, so you don't want to lose the drone. You can also initiate return to home on your own. You can tell it to come home automatically, in which case it will ascend to a predetermined height, travel horizontally until it's directly above the launch site, and then descend. You can also bring it home manually by controlling its flight. Another incredibly clever uh, function of the drone is you, it can avoid obstacles so it doesn't smash into buildings. It does this through the use of multiple sensors. And I've just given you a list of some of them here. Well, what makes a drone fly? What cause it, it to move or hover in the air? And it turns out that the standard drone has four propellers, which are driven by four motors. And these motors are divided into pairs. One pair rotates clockwise, the other pair rotates counterclockwise. And that's really all there is to it. The varying of voltage to these four motors is responsible for every movement of the drone. This is an image that shows you the four propellers, two of which are rotating clockwise, and two of which are rotating counterclockwise. So they provide the lift that fights gravity and allows the drone to ascend or descend or just hover. They also allow rotation in the horizontal plane. That's this motion and they allow the plane to go forward or backward, sideways left, sideways right, and you control these 
with joysticks. And the joysticks send messages to the, to the internal computer that integrates the motion, the individual motion of the four motors. The motions are, are facilitated by data feedback and the data feedback comes from devices that you know a lot more about than I do. Accelerometers, gyroscopes and altimeters. And the feedback is almost instantaneous. Now you've got a drone flying up in the sky, it's being buffeted by wind. How do you maintain a perfect level hover feedback from these, this data? Well, the drone's in the air, you've got to communicate with it. And you do that with a controller, which sends radio signals to the drone and receives radio signals back from the drone. The standard radio frequency is 2.4 gigahertz. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the FAA tells you to maintain line of sight and radio signals more or less require line of sight. And I know there are some exceptions. Live video is the heart of what a photographer needs. And that is dependent on the radio signal transmission. And the radio signals can come from two different operating frequencies or from, you can use them, simul you can let the drone choose which is more efficient, which is wonderful. The video display can be sent to your device. I use an iPhone. It can also, if you have a fancy remote control unit that will have its own screen, it will be sent to that as well, or you can have it sent to both. My, my controller does not have an independent screen, so I need to use an iPhone. The gyroscopes I've mentioned already, they maintain stability and they continually monitor data. The drone communicates with global satellites and I didn't realize that there were two systems and my drone will communicate with both systems, the uh, GPS and the global navigation satellite system. Well, what kind of information is recorded? The current location of the drone, the takeoff location, which is critical because you want the drone to come home, the recovery location if the drone crashes, and I've had that experience, and every drone operator will at some time have that experience. And it also gives you a continuous record of a or flight log, which is really cool. There is something called geofencing, which is very useful. It's a safety issue. It will prevent your drone from entering an illegal or dangerous area, so-called no-fly zone. I've already alluded to that about my experience going out to the Great North Bridge area and finding that I am unable to take off. Well, this is a picture of the DJI Mavic Air 2, which is the drone that I own. Mine is Amelia. And as I said, she really is cute and she's very small. Do you see these arms? They fold into the body. You can literally put this drone in your pocket. As a photographer, I'm interested in the camera. The camera of my drone is a half inch sensor, which is basically the same as um, high end um, smartphones. It has a fixed aperture. And if you're a photographer, you say, oh, that's not very good. But it really isn't a big issue because um, the aperture opening 
is useful to a photographer in two ways. One is for controlling the amount of light coming in, and the other is for depth of field. Well, depth of field isn't an issue when you're 300 feet or 400 feet or even 50 feet and you're capturing an object on the ground. You're basically working with depth of field of infinity from that height. The, con the controls of the camera can be set to be automatic or can be customized, up to you. And in my camera, you can record in either JPEG or a combination of JPEG and raw. If you're a serious photographer, and I guess I'm not that serious, you use raw. The newer cameras ca go even further, larger sensors and variable apertures and optical zoom. Most, cam most drone cameras can do a, a digital zoom, which as you all know, isn't real zoom. You basically you do the same thing in your digital darkroom, blowing up your image. Well, what's special about drone photography? Why would I be interested in even learning it? And the answer, the single most important answer, is that it offers you an almost infinite choice of perspective, which terribly important. You have variable angles, you're changing the camera angle from zero to 90 degrees, zero to 90. You can go up to 400 feet or down to whatever. I, I try not to go, go below 50 feet. You can pan horizontally. And if you're concerned about light, if light, you can use the light creatively by flying around and then aiming backwards. You can have the light behind you or in front of you or from the side. You have the same exposure options that you do with a standard camera. You can even project a histogram onto your live screen. You can Choose your white balance, your color balance. You can do high dynamic range. And if you're into videos, there is no end to the creative options you have. I don't go there. I have enough to keep me busy with still images. Well, what are the problems? Um, there, there are problems. And uh, the I think what one of the problems is you need to work very rapidly. Battery life is limited. My drone has a battery life in theory of 30 to 35 minutes, which is like forever. In practice, because of the things that can go wrong, I never have a shoot that goes beyond 20 minutes because I never know what problems I'm going to encounter on the trip home. And you've got objects that are moving, of course. You've got a multitask. You're doing all the things that you can do at leisure on the ground, composing, setting your camera settings. But in addition, you've got to monitor and respond to safety warnings. And you will get them. Some of them are genuine. Others are, are bogus, and we don't understand why they're coming. And of course, you're limited to weather conditions, which we'll talk about in a minute. You can't fly under certain conditions. As a practical matter, uh, those of you who are not drone owners may want to ask yourselves several questions. Should I own a drone? And that's a basic question before you go any further. What are you going to do with your drone? If you're a serious photographer, I highly recommend that you own a drone. 
Uh, if you, but what are the other applications? You're going to spy on your neighbors. You're going. I mean, so before you buy a drone, ask how you're going to use it. Once you decide to buy a drone, you have to shop for it. And then how do you get trained? Well, shopping uh, here, I can offer you some personal tips. You're going to find a lot of other tips on the internet. The DJI company is dominant. They are responsible for 75% of the recreational drone market. And I strongly recommend that you buy a DJI drone. They have enormous experience. They have a wide variety of models. And when I've had problems, they've been responsive in servicing. Uh, about a year ago, you may have seen a small news article that the U.S. military has decided to stop using DJI drones for obvious reasons. Uh, you can spend as little as $50 to $85 million. Um, if any of you have $85 million, this is what you can get. You recognize ingenuity which was carried to Mars in the underbelly of perseverance. But most of us probably don't need that. And my drone cost $1,000 and it is just unbelievable in the way that it operates and the features it offers. But you can get a very good DJI Mini for 600 or you can get models fancier than mine for 1400. You don't have to go higher than 1400. What do you look for when you shop? Safety? Is it going to crash into objects? Are you, are, do you feel secure at getting it home? Do you, have, do you have redundancy built in? And is it easier to oper, easy to operate? And then the photographer in you is going to ask about sensor size and other photographic features. What do I do when I go out on a shoot? Well, first, before I ever go out, I decide where I'm gonna go. Is it an aesthetically interesting area? And I find Google Earth invaluable. I search on Google Earth for sites of visual interest, but also that offer a safe launch site. An area of, physical, of visual interest is of no value if it's five miles from the nearest road, I confirm on the day that I'm, I'm going to visit the site that it has safe temperature parameters and safe wind velocity, which I've listed here. I drive to the launch site, I launch the drone, and I record images. My drone has the ability to call to record the images not only on an SD card that's in the drone itself, but also through my smartphone. So that is an enormous value to have the backup. And as I mentioned already, in theory, my drone will go 30 to 35 minutes. I rarely go over 20 or 25 minutes. I'm now going to show you, actually, at this point, uh, Steve, at this point, before I show images, I think we've got time to, no, no, I changed my mind. I will show you images, and then we'll open up to questions. It's too, uh, too confusing. So here are some images. Um, as a photographer, I tend towards abstraction as opposed to documentation. So there will be a certain bias in the images I'm about to show. This is similar to a conventional landscape image. And it has a large depth of field, foreground to background. It shows the horizon. So this isn't all that different 
from a shot you could take from a mountaintop. This happens to be the uh, Sudbury River. This is a little different. It is a, again a landscape and it's again the Sudbury River taken from where Route 17 uh, comes close to in Concord, comes close to Mount Misery, it comes close to Mahoney's Garden Center and, um, and the, um, the farm, Virile Farm, you know that area. This is of course taken in winter. It appeals to me for the textures. You see open water, you see ice in gray and snow in white. This is taken in Lexington, one of the conservation trail. I think this is uh, Chiesa Farm up Adam Street. I, I think some of you are Lexington residents, so you may recognize this. And of course it's taken in the autumn. You will immediately recognize this tree. It's on the Belmont Golf Course in the winter. And it's a, uh, taken with a background of snow. And I, I just like the silhouette. Winter is, offers opportunities and challenges. The opportunities are that you simplify things in snow, which gives to some of us what we feel are more interesting, dramatic, crisp Im images. This would be an example. This is taken in Orleans. I happen to have family in Orleans. Uh, you are not allowed to use a drone in a national park or seashore. This is taken on the bay side from near Skaket Beach. The meeting of land and sea is very valuable for drone images. Lakes, rivers, oceans. This is taken near the same location. It's a, uh, what do I call it? A, uh, um, it's a uh, very simple image. And these are actually man-made structures. I'm told that they're artificial oyster beds. By the way, I want you to note the camera angles. This is more towards the horizon. This is 90 degrees down. This is in between, in between. This is 90 degrees down. It's the Great Marsh in the North Shore, Essex. Again, the meeting of land and water and the re sun's reflection helps too. If anyone recognizes this, raise your hand. You've all been here, every one of you. Steve, would you uh, monitor, would you vet this? Any people have their hands up and call on them? Bill, Quinn. Uh, looks like the old res. Nope. No? Nope. Bob, Primate. Would that be Walden Pond? Bob, you're excused from the rest of the talk. Your reward for guessing correctly. It is Walden Pond, obviously in the winter. And the clue is here, isn't it? The boathouse. I don't know yes. if you know, I don't know if you'd recognize it without the boathouse. I'm gonna I should uh, Photoshop the boathouse out, make it harder. <laughs> this is a little pond in East Lexington behind the Waldorf School. Who knew that uh, this rather boring little pond 
could produce a, a surreal image. This again, you will immediately recognize you golfers as the Belmont Golf Course. And I assume it's a water, part of this is a water feature. Sand and gravel sites are very rewarding. This is a sand and gravel site up Route 93. Very subtle color, but I just appeals to me and the abstract quality. This is right here in Lexington. Yep. Yep, it's that golf course on Waltham Street. And I've chosen to print this in black and white, which is always a, a photographer's option. This is, you've all been here, but I don't think you'll recognize it. This is the Monk's Garden at the Gardner Museum, taken during the pandemic in, win in uh, late fall, early winter. And I'm shooting down through trees. This is probably 50 to 75 feet in the air. It's a low shot. And the, the uh, landscape designs at the Gardner Museum have been redone periodically. Most recently, about four or five years by von Kalkenberg, who's the, uh, the director of the landscape department at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And his firm redid the, the monk's garden and they put in these marvelously curved pathways. So you have man and nature superimposed. This you will recognize, of course, those of you who live in Belmont, you have your victory garden at the Belmont Victory Garden near the, um, the uh, State near the private hospital, the McLean Hospital. And these Victory Garden sites are just fascinating. And I do these every time of the year, they change. This was taken on the Fenway, and I'm not even sure what it is, a man made structure. I don't know if it's the Rose Garden, it might be but I'm not 100% sure. So man-made structures are interesting. There's another man-made structure right here in Lexington on the, um, the it's very, it's off the soccer gardens on Lincoln Street, across from one of the temples. There is a path that leads to a meditation site, man-made. It's like Stonehenge, isn't it? Yeah. This is the Stone and Gravel Company at the end of Adams Street. It's actually in, in Burlington. Very narrow range, spectrum of color. This is a boat yard up in Essex. This is a building in Cambridge near, um, near the uh, Alewife Tea Stop. And that's it. I'm, I'm within the 45 minute time limit that I've imposed on myself. And um, Steve, I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna come out of this and come back to the, um, the gallery view so I can now actually see everybody. And let me look at what the chat questions are. Oh, what's it? Okay. Could I ask Ken, why are you selling? <laughs> Ken? So I'm, I'm getting less than half price and it's about a year old, never crashed. So, so why are you selling? Um, 
I guess you could say I'm bored with it. <laughs> okay, that's a good yeah. reason. Yeah. And that goes back to my first, the first question you should ask yourself, what are you going to do with it? Yeah. These are expensive toys. Yeah. Oh, can I add a couple more things? Sure. There's some nice features in video. I know you said you're not into video, but you know, very quickly, for example, you, you could track an object that's moving like a person on a bicycle very easily. Okay. You can uh, imagine that, the value of that for it for military use, can't you? You see it in commercials a lot too. Yeah. Another thing that in, in real estate, what they do is you can like focus, let's say, on the chimney of a house and do a nice orbit all around and get a nice view all around the house. Uh, time lapse is another thing. You know, if, if you have a like like a drawbridge scene that's taking a long time, you you could uh, shrink the time down. About five years ago, my wife and I attended a presentation at uh, uh, a, a, a place in Boston. I forgot its name right off. Uh, and they were talking about drones and it has some pictures of some rather expensive professional drones and a video produced from them. I'd like to show you uh, when we're done with this part. Great. That sounds great. There was a question that is the camera part of the GJI package. Um, except for extremely expensive drones, where the purchaser is, the commercial drones, where the, the purchaser is going to mount their own fancy camera. All basic recreational drones come with a camera. And in regard to package, um, if you buy a drone, I urge you if you buy the DJI drone, get the package that comes with it. You need extra batteries. You need extra propellers. You need a charger. So it's not, they're not uh, trying to exploit you. Those are basic things you should buy with the drone. Um, reliance on raw images if enlarging the scale. Uh, let's see. Uh, the question start was well, a long question. Let me go back to the beginning of it's it. It's not so much a question as a statement. Uh, you were talking about digital zoom. Yeah. And Bob is saying uh, the difference between digital and analog zoom. Yeah. I mm -hmm. actually what I'm saying is with digital zoom, you can only zoom in on the data points you have and you aren't increasing the number of data points. Whereas if you can use a, a raw image, you have more data points. That's by a raw good... image, I think you mean an analog image uh, by an optical zoom as opposed to a digital zoom. Is that correct, Bob? No, mm -hmm. I mean that raw images generally have much higher resolution. The raw image captures everything that the camera lens sees. If you, if you shoot in JPEG, the camera has, is already making selection for you that you're not aware of. So mm -hmm. it's only recording on the sensor a portion of all the data that was theoretically available. Bob, as an engineer, did I say it right? Well, I'm not an engineer, but I've heard from a lot of photography people and I, they all tell the same story. So I went online and read a few things. Yeah. So yeah, I think you got it. So I, I, I think don't it's know. a compression technique. So it's a lossy compression technique. Exactly. It takes everything and then it tries to optimize what you get for a, a picture, but it's, yep. it's not perfect. And you can set different compression ratios on the JPEG, depending yep. on how much uh, you want to lose and how small the image you want to get to. Yeah, and JPEG differs from GIF or GIF as they used to call it, I in that GIF is lossless and you don't have those uh, losses and it can be expanded. PNG is another one for uh, web images, which mm -hmm. also doesn't have as much loss. Yeah. Hey, how, how, could, how could I ask you a, a technical question on- oh, Sure, Jerry. What is LiDAR and what kind of battery uh, pack does it have? Well, the batteries are lithium um, polymer and they're rechargeable. It has the, to be light, right? Yes, everything should be light. I'm glad you, you said that because the, the, the drone itself is made from 
light material, carbon composite. I had to look up carbon, carbon composite fibers when I took up drones. And I had to look up LIDAR. Uh, I now I've already forgotten what the initials stand for. Uh, anyone want to help me out or you can immediately go to, I, I looked that up, Jerry, I didn't know. It's, it's one of the multiple sensing uh, tools that are built in to the drone. Yeah, LIDAR. I covered that during my talk a couple a couple of years ago about scanning buildings like Notre Dame Cathedral before and after the fire. I, it is a light-based or laser-based uh, scanning method, which produces, uh, at best, a point cloud that can have like millions of points, and it can form a very precise image and make very precise measurements of distance. How much do drones cost? I, I, I tried to cover that. You can buy a drone for 50 bucks or, and, or $38 billion, but for practical purposes, 600 to 1400 will get you a quality drone that will do everything you can imagine. Now, human, oh, human, can I ask you about human nature is that once we have a tool, Humans are, uh, invariably find nefarious uses for them. <laughs> what, what, what are the nefarious uses that drones, uh, I'm just asking for information, of course. Uh, what are the nefarious <laughs> uses that, 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 that drones have been used for? Jerry, we'll talk after the, after the program's <laughs> over. We'll, we'll have a side session. I would tell you, though, that I've now done two roof inspections for friends. <laughs> but those images are absolutely fabulous. Pardon? Those images you created were fabulous. Yeah. Well, beauty, how, how long does it take to get one of those images? is in the eye of the, of the uh, beholder. Another question is, were you a doctor in Lexington? The answer is yes. And I recognize some of you because I suspect that when I was in medical practice, I delivered you, and you look exactly the same. <laughs> bold, bold, and, a, bold and cranky. Right. <laughs> I have a question uh, on, on doing a chimney. Let's say you want to look at your chimney. I live too close to Hanscom Field for, this, for the unit to run. So how do, you over, how do you overwhelm that? You're only going out 50 feet to look at the chimney. I can't. Uh, if you there are there is another license, the F, the 107 license for commercial use. I don't know if a commercial, commercially registered drone pilot uh, get is allowed to fly at a certain altitude. I mean, for your roof. I know there are a lot of mega mansions here, but how high is your roof? Yeah. 400 feet? No. No, well, even the well, mansions in Lexington don't go that, don't go that high. Al, you said that uh, if you're within five miles of an airport such as Hanscom, that uh, you cannot fly a drone. Uh, I would suspect okay. that you might be able to get an exception, and I'm just suspecting this, by yeah. calling uh, Hanscom and asking them if you could do and explain what it is you want to do with your drone, you might be able to get a, a variance for a specific amount of time for a specific purpose. They I, just I'm sure you're right, Steve. And even yeah. now, I, I told you the, the five mile limit was not, that it was more complicated. I get within five miles. I mean, there are parts of Lexington, like Lincoln, the Lincoln playing fields are within five miles. I shoot there. You will get warning messages that require you to sign off on responsibility, depending on how close you are. So it is more complicated than just five miles. So I are actually you have saying a, that you cannot or you drone. should not? I'm sorry, uh, one question at a time. Harry? Uh, yeah, I, I have an earlier DJI drone which has none of these controls on it. And, but, I also was in, involved early on when uh, they really emphasized that, and I live right under the Hanscom flight, flight path. And so what I do is I call up Hanscom 
and basically say, I'm going to be, I'd like to fly my drone for the next two hours. And here is my location. Um, and they almost always give me an approval to do it. Wow. Um, it, it and, and it cuts down on your own spontaneity, though. I mean, you can't just go out and, and, and fly it. I've also flown uh, my drone uh, in uh, right over the, uh, the green in Lexington. Uh, high enough so you could look down on it. And again, if you ask for permission, you can usually get it. Uh, now, while I have the floor, call? Al, say what? Whom do you call at Hanscom? I can look up the number. I don't have it at my fingertips right now. Okay. Um, but I'll send it out to the group. Thank hey, you. Al, um, okay. uh, first of all, I want to say there was just an excellent presentation. I yeah. don't think we, you know, not only on the topic that you're talking about, but just in general, the preparation and delivery was terrific, and we should all use mm -hmm. this as a as a good guide as to how one can give a terrific presentation. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, you. It doesn't matter that you weren't a physicist or an electrical engineer. I think you got the point across uh, mm -hmm. in, in 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 very few words that covered the topic because I've I know most of what you were talking about. I think the 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 the, the, the still photographs were spectacular, really. And you know, a lot of the work there is in figuring out where you're going to go that will be interesting because you can shoot your drone up and find nothing but trees. <laughs> Most of what you find in Lexington is trees and finding those unusual spots, uh, interesting spots like that is, is really a talent and I, and I congratulate you on that. Um, one other thing is, um, uh, so I guess we have a little slightly different experience because I always have to call Hanscom because I don't have any automatic things that'll prevent me from making a mistake. Um, and you cannot fly a drone in Eastern Massachusetts uh, without being five miles from some possible air spot because Hanscom is only one of, uh, I would say at least a thousand points around here that are registered in the FAA little tiny helipads that are no longer being used, you, in theory, you have to check with them too. So uh, it's nice to have an automatic system to, to, to cover that. So th thank you very much for a really great, great presentation. Thank you for your comments. And those of you who, who use drones, I would like to hear more of your experiences. As a separate question, the uh, first photo you showed was uh, beautiful and you had the horizon completely uh, level. How did you do that? Was that the drone or did you have to post process that and other images to, to get them to look as beautiful as they were? No, the, the, um, the angle of the camera was probably 20 to 30 degrees or maybe even more below the horizon. The, remember the gimbal allows the drone to be at horizon or 90 degrees down. And you have the ability to manipulate that, Jonathan. So you can control that. In fact, you can even go slightly above zero to minus 20 or 30 degrees. You can control that. Hey, I have a question. Oh, question. Go ahead. Um, Thanks. Did you ever run into any sticky situations where people just don't want you to be there or questioning what, what you're doing? Good question. Um, and I've been doing this since last September and I try not to launch from private property, but I would say that half of the time I do launch from private property and I, and all the time I've been doing, I've only been challenged on one occasion, a large commercial complex off 128 in, in January during the pandemic. I was in an empty parking lot and the security uh, car came up and challenged me appropriately because it was private property. That's the only encounter. The takeoff is the critical time, takeoff and landing. It's like any air, it's like an airplane. The most 
stressful time as a takeoff and the landing. And I've gotten to the point where I can take off um, by from the time I take the drone out of my car and take off is less than 60 seconds. That's when passersby will know you're, that you're flying a drone. Once the drone is 100 feet in the air, nobody knows it's there. The drones have become quieter than they used to be. Well, I was, I, I was going to tell you my experience. I held up my hand when you asked if anybody had had a drone. And I had a drone, but I only had it for about 10 minutes. Because, <laughs> because the first thing I did was fly it over a small body of water, lose control, and sink it in the body of water. Oh. <laughs> it was There's not a thousand dollar drone. It was a hundred dollar drone. Oh, okay. There's a learning curve. And I didn't go into detail about the third question you have to ask yourself, should I own a drone? Which one should I buy? And how should I get trained? How should you get trained? A lot has to do with going out with somebody who already has a drone and is experienced and seeing what the pitfalls. Um, I'm constantly challenged. I learned something with almost every flight. Thank you.